Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, March 25th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting a public hearing for the proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for March 25th, 2024. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during tonight's public hearing. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the tonight's public hearing. Remote attendees can log in to go to meeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate that you would like to speak in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during uh, the appropriate time. If you are participating via phone, indicate that you would like to speak during the appropriate time. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Thank you. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Our public hearing tonight is public hearing for proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate and dollars and taxpayer statements. Um, Adrian, before I actually uh, take a motion on that, I realized sitting here that we, I think, made a mistake in the previous special session we had. We actually had an action item that we needed to vote on, and I think we failed to vote on the action item because we heard a presentation from, um, from our, our city manager, and um, we, I adjourned the meeting without actually voting on the action item that was, that was there. So... I'm wondering how we can proceed with that. And I apologize for the mistake because I did not catch it. I'm thinking. So we could have them. Do we have them not call this one to order? Mr. Mayor, can I ask you, was it the receive and file of the presentation? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I, I don't think that's substantive enough that we need to worry about it. Um, it doesn't require a vote. Um, I, I think, is there consensus, I think, at this point? So that, for the, I just want to make sure, since it is a requirement of the state of Iowa that we have this budget presentation, the budget presentation was had, we heard it, we have a, a meeting that we put into session and then we adjourned that meeting. But we did present it as an action item and I'm, it's not required. I, no, I, I don't think that piece is required. I think that pe the piece we're doing now is the required piece. Oh, I see. Okay, so the piece we just did wasn't necessarily a requirement. It was something that we wanted to make sure we presented as a city. And so we did it for transparency's sake, not as a matter of law. And the legal requirement is that the hearing that we are about to do now be separate from anything else, which is why we had the two. So this this meeting that Adrian is about to call Got it. is the the important and separate piece that we need to do. Okay. So I, I right. think we're okay. I don't think it, it damages anything related to the state required process. Great. So we had a separate meeting just previous to this to be able to hear the budget presentation from the city manager that basically lays out the whole budget for us and allows us to, to hear that and present it. And then we're going to go through it piece by piece and department by department, essentially dollar by dollar for the next, what is it, seven or eight meetings? I don't know. We're going to have a bunch of meetings about the, the budget in, in its entirety. So, um, so with that said, even though we called it an action item on that agenda, we are going to move forward without necessarily having a vote on that because all we were doing there was receiving and filing and hearing the presentation. Correct. Okay, fair enough. Everybody clear on that? Just because I caught it as we were, as Adrian was calling the roll here. Okay, wonderful. So with that then, as Adrian just said, we have a public hearing for proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate and the dollars and taxpayer statements. And I will entertain a motion on this, please. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and approve the proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate. Second. 
We've got a motion by Ms. Farber and a second by Mr. Jones. We will remember to vote on this later after we hear a nice public <laughs> hearing. And for that, I will turn it over to Mike. Thank you, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. So what I'm gonna do is uh, present information on what is in the budget recommendation, and you're of course gonna vote on the levy as the state of Iowa requires before you actually do all your deliberations on what's in the budget. The state of Iowa requires you to adopt the levy. Uh, the budget development guidance is uh, based on these five things. The city council goals and priorities, major capital improvement projects, uh, leveraging federal and state grants, public safety, and streets. And at this public hearing, the only option available to the city council are to approve the amount of the proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate, uh, which you established when you set this public hearing, um, as is, or to decrease it. At this public hearing, you cannot increase the levy from what you established when you set the public hearing. The tax rate, which was set for public hearing, is this one, which is about a quarter of 1% change from the current year's property tax rate. If, in, if uh, April 11th, when you have your final budget public hearing, you will also have another opportunity to consider the property tax rate. Again, at that hearing, you can only decrease it or adopt it as is, you can't increase it. If you were to accept the recommendation and on April 11th, adopt the, the current rate that's being proposed, this would be the impact. There would be the quarter of 1% rate increase. That would bring in an additional 6% of property tax revenues. The average residential property would see about a, a $40.75, I'm sorry, $40.75 increase or about 5%. The average commercial would see about an $850 increase or just over 25%. The average industrial would see uh, about a 3.9% increase or about $187. Since 1989, the average homeowner has averaged an annual increase in cost in the city portion of their property taxes of 1.36% or about $8.41 a year. If the state had been fully funding the homestead tax credit, which they have been recently, but there were years that they didn't, the increase would have averaged approximately $5.67 a year. When you compare our uh, property tax rate with the other 10 cities in Iowa, so there's a total of 11 cities in Iowa with a population greater than 50,000. Um, some of them have established their fiscal year 25 rate, like you're being asked to do tonight for Dubuque. Um, some of them have not. So, uh, for instance, West Des Moines and Ankeny still, and this, this comparison shows their FY24 rates. Des Moines also does. But uh, if you look at how we will compare a water lose rate, which they have already adopted, is 126% higher than Dubuque's rate, and the average of the other 10 cities is 58% higher than Dubuque's proposed rate. The uh, state of Iowa did property, what they termed property tax reform last year, and part of that was that a, a form needed to be filled out, the, the form being supplied by the state, uh, submitted to Dubuque, the county, this is in every county across the state. And uh, the county auditor then mailed that to every home and business in town. Um, the city of Dubuque does it a little bit different than the form demonstrates. And I'll point that out to you how that works differently when I show you the form. Um, but the city of Dubuque, what we do is we create an average value for properties. Um, and that average goes up every year, thank goodness, which means people's properties values are increasing, and so our average goes up each year. The state of Iowa does it differently. They do a fixed $100,000 value, so I'll show you how that worked out on the form that was mailed to every home and business in, De in Dubuque County, or in our case, for the city, in the city of Dubuque. 
So since the state of Iowa says a fixed $100,000 value for residential property in the current year, and then a fixed value of $100,000 next year, um, it shows that this year that fictitious property would have paid $541 in taxes. Next year, that fictitious property would have paid $460 in taxes. So they would see a 15, 14.97, so 15% property tax reduction from the city of Dubuque. Um, as I just showed you, that's not what's going to happen uh, since property values do go up each year and we do an average of all uh, property values, which uh, Jennifer, I think you said it was about 186,000. 196,000 dollars is the average uh, residential property value in Dubuque. Um, they're actually going to see a 5% property tax increase if you adopt this levy, not a 15% decrease, but they just got a notice in the mail because of the state form requirements that said they were going to get a 15% decrease. Unfortunately, the same thing happens with commercial property, a fixed $100,000 value, uh, both this year and next year. Once again, telling commercial properties, you're gonna see a 15% decrease in your property taxes. That's not the case. Um, I will tell you that the nuance in commercial property is the first $150,000 of a commercial property gets the same rollback as residential property. What does that mean? So the state of Iowa only allows this year a taxation of about 45% of the value of residential property. That's called the rollback. They roll back the value of the, the real value of the property. And so for commercial, the first $150,000 of value, they roll back that value down to 45% of the, of the amount. And that's all that's subject to the property tax levy. So in Dubuque count, I'm sorry, in the city of Dubuque, there are 653 properties that fit that, commercial properties that fit that category out of, excuse me, I've got the other number in an email, out of a total of 1,669 properties. So uh, 653 of the 1,669 commercial properties in the city of Dubuque will get the residential rollback. And so they will not uh, get the same rate of increase as general commercial properties across the city. So I, I, I guess you could say that's a support of small business. <clears throat> so as I say in this first bullet, uh, the state of Iowa calculation really shows the impact on small business and smaller residential properties. <clears throat> Um, this is just more demonstration of the uh, form that goes to, goes to residents, but I just really explained that. And this also, once again, explains that uh, 541 versus 460. Um, the mayor and city council are required by state law to have this adop budget adopted by April 15th. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I thought the law said we have until April 30th to adopt the budget. And that was a change last year that the state of Iowa made, said instead of your deadline now being March 31st, the deadline is April 30th, unless you have a debt levy. I can tell you all the 11 largest cities in the state of Iowa have a debt levy, and my guess is most of the other cities, but I really don't know because I've never looked at it. And if you have a debt levy, you have to adopt your budget by April 15th. So they actually ended up giving us two weeks instead of a month extension. The, uh, the state had, uh, they did property tax reform, oh, now about 10 years ago, uh, and I'm gonna put quotes around the term reform. And they uh, lowered the amount of commercial and industrial property, uh, the value of commercial and industrial property that was subject to property taxes. And when they did that, they said, okay, now city, counties, and school districts, you're not gonna lose anything here. We're gonna backfill, we're gonna send you payments for your loss of revenue every year out of their general fund, the state general fund. Well, that lasted for a while. And then they told us, well, we're gonna stop doing that. 
And over time, over eight years, we're gonna incrementally reduce your payment every year till we stop paying you at all. And so uh, that, that payment this year will be $577,000. You can see this is a chart that shows the backfill payments. Uh, back in 2016, 2017, we were getting payments of $1.8 million for our lost property tax revenue. And as you can see in this, now we're gonna get $577,000. So about $1.2 million of revenue money that we'll never see. And each year that's gonna go down until uh, the last payment of 2020 in 2029. In addition, when the state back then did what I, they called property tax reform, they said that they wanted to change the way multifamily residential was taxed. And at that time, and that's a three flat or above rental unit, um, multi-residential was taxed as commercial property. So basically and then it was 100% of their value. The rate was applied against that. And the state said, what we're gonna do is every year, we're gonna reduce the amount of the assessed value of multi-residential that's taxed until it reaches the same rollback as residential, which remember residential in 2025 will be only taxed on 45% of their value. Well, that happened this year. It reached that level. So now there is no multi-residential classification. They're just classified as residential like anybody, any other single family home and they're only gonna be taxed on 45, about 45% of their value. So the city will have lost over that period from FY17 to FY24, $5.6 million in property tax revenue, and the annual loss is now permanent. We will never get any more uh, of that property tax money paid to us, and it never was backfilled like the commercial and industrial changes were for a while, that was never backfilled at all. And then in uh, House File 718 last year, uh, created new exemptions, um, and those new exemptions, uh, about 3,400 homeowners filed for those, uh, and that uh, reduced the value in FY26 of about $3,250 of taxable values not subject to the tax, FY26, that'll be $6,500. The loss of revenue to the city in FY25 is about $113,000. The state also increased the military credit and uh, increased it from $1,852 to $4,000. The uh, 1,937 uh, homeowners are gonna be eligible for the military exemption and that's gonna be a loss of revenue to the city of $77,000. The uh, city assessor by state law did a reassessment of property values and uh, the average residential property value increased 23.2% and the average commercial property value increased 25%. How does the city assessor do that? The city assessor looks at actual sales. And so that means people's property values actually increased at that rate. So I would suggest that's really good news for our property owners because things are functioning in Dubuque in a way that is making it a good investment for people to buy homes and businesses at a higher price than they were buying them before because those are actual sales. And as I said, the residential rollback, it, it changed from the current year of 54.6% uh, of the amount of the value of the home is taxed down to now it's 46.3%. Now the good news is our lease revenues for the riverfront uh, industrial properties is going up. Our local option sales tax revenues are going up. And remember how our local option sales tax revenues are used. 50% goes to property tax relief, 20% uh, goes to maintenance of city buildings, and 30% goes to street maintenance. 
Our hotel motel tax is going up. And uh, last year, uh, Moody's recognized the, uh, the good fiscal management of the mayor and city council by upgrading our bond rating. So Moody's upgraded the city's outstanding general obligation bonds from AA3 to AA2, as well as the outstanding sales tax increment revenue bonds from A2 to A1. And there's the quote from Moody's. Notable credit factors include strong financial operations and ample revenue raising flexibility, which has resulted in steadily improved available fund balance and cash. The city serves as a regional economic center and its regional economic growth rate has outpaced the nation over the past five years, close quotes. And the significance of this is, this is how when uh, investors decide how much are they gonna be willing to charge as an interest rate to loan the city money, they look at the Moody's bond rating. So every investor doesn't come in and examine our books and say, gee, how much should we charge you for an interest rate? How much of a risk are you? They count on Moody's to do that for them. So the higher your bond rating, the lower the interest rate you pay on debt because the lower risk to the investor. The, uh, there's a statutory debt limit. So the city um, is only allowed to issue uh, so much debt by state law, and that is can not exceed 5% of the assessed value of the community. So back in FY15, the city was at 90% of our statutory debt limit, which means we only had a, the ability to have 10% capacity to issue more debt. And today in FY24, we're at 41% of the statutory debt limit. And in FY25, if you adopt this budget, we would be at 34%. Is this chart accurate, um, Jennifer? The, the 41 and the 34%? Okay, but the FY24 and FY25R, that chart is accurate? I think all, they were updated when we did the 25 budget. Okay, so uh, this chart probably is outdated? It shows what was adopted in the 24. Okay. All right, if you don't mind looking at the, your chart to just see what these numbers are, what these numbers should be. On, Oh, you think it's in the next one? Okay. Oh, maybe not. Sorry. All right. You think this this is the one? Nope. That's debt limit. That's the same one. Yeah, it is. That's twenty five. This one here. Yep. Okay. So it's forty percent in FY twenty four and thirty five percent in FY twenty five. And I apologize for that. Um, putting two powerpoints together for tonight. Um, we might have had some old data that came in. Um, so as we try and do, like we do with our property tax levy, we try and compare to the other 10 cities in the state of Iowa with a population greater than 50,000. Um, as I mentioned to you in the property tax levy, we have the lowest property tax rate by far of the other cities. Um, in this case, we look at the utilization of statutory debt limit. And um, for FY25, and we don't have the FY25 numbers yet for all these other cities, correct? So these are probably their FY24 numbers. Um, we're at 30, we'll be at 34.9% of our statutory debt limit if you adopt the budget as recommended. And um, that would put us at the fifth lowest uh, use of our statutory debt limit. And uh, the average would be 21% higher than our use of the statutory debt limit. Then on the area of reserves, when you look at general fund accrual reserve um, in FY24, the current year, we're at 42%, and FY25, 34%, FY26 and beyond, estimated at 25.5%. 
Moody's requires us to also now, this is a new rule uh, adopted in the last couple of years, to not just look at our general fund reserves, they also want to look at our enterprise fund reserves combined with our general fund reserves. And remember the enterprise funds are the water fund, sanitary sewer fund, the stormwater fund, refuse collection fund. And you can see in FY24, we're at 40% of reserves, 25 will be at 35%. And we're projected at 26 and beyond to be just over 30%. Some significant issues impacting the budget is uh, the mayor and city council just recently approved a new uh, contract with the Dubuque Police Protective Association. And the cost of that contract in FY25 was 5% of base wage. Um, and there is our existing collective bargaining agreements in place that still have one more year on them. With our two Teamsters units, uh, that's at 3%. We're currently in negotiations with the Dubuque Professional Firefighters Association and the International Union of Operating Engineers. Uh, the budget shows uh, non-bargaining unit employees would also get a 5% pay raise and the cost to the general fund of this is almost $2 million. As far as improvement packages, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, but some of the uh, public safety improvements are, I'm recommending an additional fire captain to serve as a field training officer. And I'm also recommending an additional uh, bureau chief in the fire department for the EMS division. Uh, there'll be an increase in ambulance revenues projected at uh, $234,000. And when we get to improvement packages, is a, uh, the way that works is in August when the mayor and city council does their goal setting, you establish the vision statement, the mission, mission statement, five-year goals, and then you also establish one-year priorities. I give all that information back in August to the department managers and boards and commissions, and I say, now I need you to tell me what resources do you need to accomplish these things. They do that mostly in the form of improvement packages. Some of them are in the form of capital improvement project requests. And there were $3.2 million of general fund improvement package requests. And unfortunately, I'm only able to recommend 889,000 of those be funded. Most of that is in non-recurring improvement packages because what we did there was we used DRA distribution dollars to help f the fund that one-time expense uh, with non-recurring packages. Uh, most of the recurring improvement packages are not recommended. I, and I just told you about two in the fire department that are recommended. We're doing some major capital improvement programs in this budget, uh, $47 million for the Catfish Creek uh, sewer shed intercept or sanitary sewer improvements. Um, $6.2 million uh, for a high strength waste project at the Water and Resource Recovery Center. That'll mostly be paid by the companies who bring us the high strength waste. Uh, $3 million in improvements to our industrial controls at the Water and Resource Recovery Center. $1.1 million for capacity upgrades for BOD in the Water and Resource Recovery Center. And this is just a map that shows you what I told you about the Catfish Creek sewer shed changes. So the purple there on the right is some new sewer, some replacement sewer, and a new expanded lift station. Uh, the green line is replacement of uh, sewer that is about almost 50 years old, uh, was installed with great foresight in the early 80s uh, to serve these new growing areas of the community. In other words, areas they hoped would grow someday. Uh, the problem is they undersize the sewers and the sewers are 50 years old and so they need replacement. Uh, the, the line on the left is actually a new sewer that would come off of those sewers that would serve the Southwest Arterial Corridor. So now that the Southwest Arterial is complete, we can start having development on the Southwest Arterial. There's $2.6 million in sanitary sewer improvements on Chaplain Schmidt Island. 
to support the over $80 million project being implemented there by the Dubuque Racing Association and the $15 million project that you'll hear about in a minute uh, by the city. There's $1.7 million in uh, Southwest Arterial Water Main Extension. And this shows that on the right, it shows the purple lines. That's the $1.7 million project. Extend the water line from basically Creekwood Lane up to the Southwest Arterial. The projects on the left side of this illustration are not part of this budget recommendation. Um, the Mayor and City Council has approved a program to help uh, some of our low-income residents replace their uh, private lead water service line. It's a $5.7 million program. Uh, we can get a no interest loan from the Iowa Finance Authority. Uh, they're using federal dollars to do that. And not only is it no interest, but 49% of the loan is forgivable, so we don't have to pay it back. <clears throat> we also last year had some tests on our water system that showed in our shallow wells that we were um, had some PFAS uh, uh, that exceeded uh, levels that exceeded the uh, EPA levels. But in our deep wells, they did not. And so we don't get our water from the river. We get it from deep wells from an aquifer and shallow wells from a different aquifer. And so this almost $10 million project will dig another deep well so that the only times we have to use the shallow wells is in the summer when we have uh, extremely high usages. And then we think we can blend it at a rate that will still keep our PFAS levels under the EPA standards. And we're also looking into doing some other plant improvements related uh, to PFAS. We'll be uh, on the, the Water Department third pressure zone, which is uh, we're gonna connect Tanzanite Drive and Olympic Heights with a $2 million project that includes, that improves our redundancy. And uh, on the Chaplain Schmidt Island sanitary and sewer improvements, I wanted to point out to you that $218,000 of that $2.9 million project is going to be from federal dollars. Uh, the Kerper Boulevard Sanitary Sewer Lift Station Replacement Project, which we're doing to serve the new over 200 unit apartment complex that's being built on the old Bowling and Beyond site. It replaces a, a sanitary sewer lift station that is beyond its useful life and needs to be replaced and also does not have enough capacity to handle the additional development. Um, and those are $1.5 million in federal dollars. This is a map that illustrates those two projects I just mentioned. The map there on the right, the purple with the red circle, is the new lift station. And then on the left, that's uh, those red lines are the sewer lines and the new lift station that'll be built on Chaplin Schmidt Island. The B Branch Gate and Pump Replacement Project for $28.2 million is in this budget. We've already received a $7.8 million US EDA grant, and we're very optimistic that by August, we will have received an $8 million uh, grant from Homeland Security. Now, in this budget of this $28 million, it, are, it shows that we're getting the $7.8 .8 million in US EDA money. It does not yet show we're getting $8 million from Homeland Security because uh, that's not a certainty yet, but we think it, it very soon will become a certainty. Should that happen, you can revisit the rate recommendations that I'm going to be recommending to you for stormwater or look at adding projects to the capital improvement program because there were many projects that were not included in the program that uh, staff believes are needed uh, but were not affordable. Um, in the budget is a construction of the 14th Street overpass that is determinant on receiving a $25 million federal raise grant um, to, to help fund that. Um, this is a partnership because it will also, it, it not only will give the low income census tracts in this area access to the jobs on Kerper Boulevard, including the industrial park and the industrial riverfront, but also the jobs on Schmidt Island. And so in support of that, the Dubuque Race Racing Association helped us fund uh, our match for the federal planning grant that we got last year for two and a half million dollars for the over $4 million in planning that we had to do. 
And so the total project is $43 million, and we're optimistic that we'll receive the $25 million construction grant. And that will not only build the overpass, but it will also, as you can see from this map, um, the overpass is the uh, green line and the yellow line though, there in the lower left-hand corner. It will also create a complete street on Elm Street. That's the north-south line there on the left side of the page uh, from five points to the uh, intermodal facility. It'll complete a, create a complete street on 16th Street from Elm to Admiral Sheehy Drive, the entrance to Schmidt Island, where there'll be a roundabout constructed, and there'll be a roundabout constructed at 16th and Sycamore Street, as you can see in this illustration. This is an artist rendering of the uh, bridge project over the railroad. This is an artist rendering of the Elm Street Complete Street Projects. You can see the bike lanes integrated into the street plan. We also uh, received a $3 million grant from the Iowa Economic Development Authority to build a $15.8 million uh, amphitheater on, Sch on Chaplin Schmidt Island. Uh, the Dubuque Racing Association is also supporting the, the debt payments on that project, and, um, and that is in the five-year CIP. Now, this is not a city project, but I think it's important enough capital improvement project that it should be mentioned in this presentation. So this would be a complete reconstruction of the Northwest Arterial and US-20 uh, intersection by the Iowa Department of Transportation. It's a $17.5 million project. It's, the city would be contributing $5.5 million to the project, mostly through DMATS funds, federal DMATS funds. And the Iowa DOT would be uh, providing $12 million, um, and they would actually be managing and doing the project. This is the project. Uh, it will, sh it, it, should it be approved by the IDOT Commission, it will close the southern leg of this four-way intersection, so the access to Walmart, and that'll become a frontage road. It will also close the access to the car dealers on the northwest corner of the intersection. They'll access their dealers through a frontage road, the I old highway road. And it will also create for westbound traffic on Highway 20 that wants to turn north on the northwest arterial, they no longer would approach the intersection. They would have an acceleration lane that they would access long before they got to the intersection and allow them to accelerate onto the Northwest Arterial northbound. $24 million for five flags is in this budget. And then there's also $3 million to replace the software system for the police department, fire department, 911 emergency communications, and the Dubuque County Sheriff's Department and all the volunteer fire departments across the county. So in recognition of that expanded purpose, Dubuque County would be paying $1.5 million of the $3 million in cost. In the capital budget is $8.8 million for the fire department. It would replace two existing fire engines for $1.5 million, replace an existing ambulance for $400,000, a fire rescue boat for $340,000. There'd be uh, $467,000 improvements to the fire uh, burn tower that we're, we're in in partnership with the volunteer departments across the uh, county. Uh, it would uh, provide $4.8 million for fire station expansion. And in other words, either an additional or a replacement fire station that did bump back one year from uh, last year's budget and it would spend $1.4 million to remodel all the bunk rooms in the existing fire stations. From the street program would be five miles of asphalt overlays performed by our public works department. As I mentioned, the 14th Street overpass and the roundabouts, uh, the Northwest Arterial and US 20 Dodge Street intersection improvements, and then Central Avenue corridor streetscape improvements. This recommended budget will support continued investment in people, businesses, and organizations that are making a difference in our community and continued investment in the infrastructure that must exist for Dubuque continue to thrive. And as the council has adopted and instructed, our goal is to create an equitable community and organization of choice, a high performance organization and community with engaged employees and residents 
that is data-driven and outcome-focused, built on the five pillars of resiliency, sustainability, equity, transparency, and compassion, and we do that through planning, partnerships, and people. There's gonna be plenty of opportunities for the public to have input on this budget. Uh, one of them is tonight. This is a public hearing where the public can uh, weigh in on their opinion on the recommended property tax levy, which the mayor and council needs to adopt the levy before the end of the night. And then there will be a series of public meetings the mayor and city council are gonna hold and individual departments will make presentations to you. And then at each one of these public meetings, Mayor Cavanaugh asked if there was any public input about that department's budget. Those are gonna occur on March 26th, March 27th, March 28th, April 2nd, April 4th, April 8th, and April 9th. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven public meetings after tonight's public hearing. And then, there'll be another public hearing on April 11th on the total budget. And that night you have to adopt a budget and a tax levy because by state law, you have to do that by April 15th. There's plenty of opportunity in person or people can go on the city website and provide you input about the budget uh, recommendation. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Mike. Well, as Mike mentioned, we are in a public hearing to consider the City Council approval of the proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate, and um, <clears throat> the, uh, of which the city manager is recommending approval, uh, tax rate and dollars, I should say, uh, of which the city manager is recommending approval. So at this time, we'd welcome any public input if we have any here. And as you come up, I'll just uh, a couple of reminders. Um, name and address, please. Uh, also, we'll, we'll do uh, five minutes for any public input and uh, just ask that we keep our comments tonight, at least for this public hearing, as, as focused as we can and as civil as we can. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Clark Slows, 2925 Burlington Street, Dubuque. Um, I'd just like to start out by thanking the city for letting me speak here. And I appreciate the process um, that you go through because I've worked in county government for 26 years and had to go through the budget process. And I kind of like the way the city does it, not one massive public hearing, because I'm sure we'd be here for 24 hours straight, <laughs> maybe longer, <laughs> uh, you know, where you break it up, break those public hearings up into specific, you know, categories, because my area of interest is infrastructure, public works, and I'll be attending those public hearings. Um, the thing that out of the budget that kind of concerns me is that when you see 5% increase, you know, for non-union employees, the consumer price index from December 22 to December 23 was 3.4%. So if you're getting a raise more than cost of living, there are other, what's the reason for that? You know, you can accept, was there an increase in productivity? If that answer is no, are you having trouble keeping people because you know, the salaries aren't good enough. What's the reason for salaries more than the consumer price index on that? Um, the other thing that, you know, the letters that went out for, you know, selling what the property tax levy rate was and comparing it to a $100,000 home. Um, the, the thing that I sent an email to the city asking, what's the levy rate going to be? And I was just expecting, you know, a simple whatever it is, $9. Um, I basically got the entire presentation from the, from the work session and the public hearing. I like to play with numbers. It's what I did for a living. And I appreciate the information. It was way more than what I expected. And I appreciate that. But um, the other thing that concerned me, too, is the, how should we say, I don't know if this would be the proper place to bring this up is what I saw, you know, the sewer water rate increases, the percentages of those, three to four times more than the consumer price index. Is this just a fluke, a one-time, one-year thing? Or is this gonna be the city's trend over the next few years? Because love to grow garden in the summertime. It's gonna be now, you're starting looking at 
Am I going to be able to afford to water my garden when it's August and we're in a moderate to severe drought? The answer is going to be no. So I don't know if this is the time or place to bring that up or when we have the public hearing for public works to bring that up then. Um, the other thing too is to remind people, um, you know, when you get your tax bill, you know, look at, look at that tax bill. Because when I bought my house and when it came and looked at it, said the house I had had a full basement. No, you got to make sure and check that. You know, we had maybe half the house had a full, you know, basement under it. Rest of it was crawl space. I'm going, so you're basing, you know, your valuation on something that isn't true. So you need to check that. Also, too, you know, pay attention. There's a difference between your assessed value and your taxable value. I don't know if people realize that or not. Uh, I know when the uh, Telegraph Herald had an article on the letters that went out and the editorial board made comments that all people want to know how much their taxes are going to go up or down. Well, with that letter, it was impossible because that levy rate hasn't been adopted yet. So how can you tell them you know, what their taxes are going to be until you vote on it. So what the paper was asking for was impossible to do. You can maybe make an educated guess and maybe get relatively close, but, you know, I think maybe too, the paper needs to, instead of, you know, criticize, you know, the state requiring these letters, it's good that you have one letter that tells you where all these public hearings, the who, what, when, where, how, and why the basics of journalism on that. So I appreciated that letter, so I knew, you know, I'm gonna attend the school board public hearing for the first time ever. Uh, gonna attend the county public hearing for Dubuque County. Been at Jackson County's where I worked there for years and attended those. But, uh, you know, it's good that that information is provided in those letters. Um, whether or not, you know, comparing a $100,000 home for 24 and 25, you need to look at what your own taxable value is. And, you know, maybe it's just me, but anybody who's passed high school algebra, once you know those levy rates that roll back, you should be able to calculate what, you, and you know what your tax credits are. You should be able to calculate what your property taxes are. It's easier than doing your income tax, as far as I'm concerned on that. So I, I just want to, you know, note that Hopefully, especially on the water rates, that this isn't a trend that's going to continue where these are going to go up three to four times the rate of inflation. You just can't afford that because, um, let's put it this way, I'm on Medicare. Those annual rates for Part B and premiums increased over the last 20 years at a rate of almost 6%. The, you know, if there are other insurances, you know, like you get your... Part D plans that go up by three to four or five, six percent, depending on which plan you have. I'm sure Alliant Energy and Black Hills Energy are going to be asking for rate increases that are above the consumer price index. So that can only go on for so long before you know you reach a point where how am I going to be able to afford something? When I look at something like that, when it goes up, I equate it to okay. Um, you know, that's so many, you know, if property taxes come up, that's so many gallons of gasoline that that's going to cost me. I, and since I mentioned that, since January, when I, I keep track of all this, to love doing it, the price of gas went up 14% from the first time I filled up in January to last Saturday when I filled up the price per gallon. So, you know, these double digits or, you know, more than 5% increases, just isn't sustainable. That's all I got. Thank well, thank you. you very much, Clark, for your comments. Any other public input this evening here in chambers? Mr. Mayor, City Council staff, my name is Robin Kenneker on Elm Street. Uh, thank you tonight for holding this public hearing. Um, I know a lot of people wanted to come tonight, but the game's on. So a lot of folks are watching <laughs> the, the Iowa Lady Hawks and. <laughs> I would listen to them pretty soon, shortly, too. Like I said, thank you again for doing all that. This is not going to be an easy decision. I've known for the last year or two that the, um, the state of Iowa and the legislatures have basically given, not given back the money they're supposed to to every city and county 
and town and state of Iowa. They reneged on their promises, what they did. And I can foresee the future here. You know, next year, the year after, when they do this flat sales tax, that means less money coming into the coffers, less money going back to the cities and towns, so higher property taxes, higher sales taxes, might be happening for the state of Iowa. So I encourage, you know, anybody who really wants to tackle this problem, problem and cut it off at the pass, we need more people in the legislature to have a voice of opinion. So get out this November, hold your nose if you have to, vote for somebody else, and get more people involved in the state legislature to say, no, we want a fair and balanced Iowa. We don't want a one-sided here and one-sided here. There's gotta be a compromise to help out because a lot of cities and states are gonna go under, or cities and counties are gonna go under, or have the highest property tax rate you've ever seen like Illinois does. So I want to thank you for keeping it low this year, but I foresee the next few years, if things go the way I think they're going to go, and people don't get out and voice their opinion to the governor and the staff, we have a lot of higher property taxes and sales tax. So thank you all for doing a good job. I appreciate it. Thank you, Robin, for your comments. All right, I don't see anybody else here. Uh, do we have any virtual comments this evening? We do not. All right, thank you. Anything from and City no, Clerk's office? No written input. All right. Well, we appreciate the public input, hoping to hear a lot more as we go through this process here. But for tonight, we'll just bring it back to the table for questions and discussion. Ms. Wilfong. I had a question related to our first hearing, actually. I just wanted to go back and ask. Um, for the $47 million Catfish Creek uh, Sewer Shed Interceptor Sanitary Sewer Improvements that are um, slated, can you share a potential timeline for what the community can expect on how long that will take? I assume it is a pretty, pretty big project, so. Uh, yes, it is. Um, um, oh, I'm pardon sorry. Me. Can I intervene for a minute? Um, Per the state code, um, I think we're supposed to limit to this to just the public input tonight. This is supposed to be this, the separate meeting specifically on the action before the council. And I, I think the discussion is better left to the individual department and project oh, evenings. Oh, no kidding. Oh. oh. Because this is supposed to be a separate meeting just for the, the public input and the public input pieces related to moving the process forward. Well, we keep on learning about new processes, okay. don't we? Well, okay. so real quick then, Krenna, the, so we as far as discussion then goes from us as a council, um, do you have suggestions for us um, on how what we could discuss tonight? I mean, can we discuss public input we received? Can we discuss the, um, the, the rate itself? I mean, we, we did have discussion during the setting of this public hearing. So just curious what your thoughts are. So... I want to look something up quick. Sure. And in the meantime, I, then I, I apologize, Ms. Wevel. I, I, I cut you off in the last meeting, and I apologize for not letting you have any feedback there. And I think, Mr. Resnick, you may have been ready to say some things, too, so I apologize for that. So the, the House File 718, which was the law that changed all of the process and added this separate bit, um, so this hearing had to be separate from any other meeting of the city or county, including any meeting or public hearing related to budget other and, or other business. Um, so information not related to the proposed property tax amounts and information in the budget statements may not be conducted at the meeting at which the public hearing is held. Um, So based on that, I think the cautious action would be to not to have any discussion, um, but to follow the suggested disposition and then have the discussion of all of the pieces related to the budget on the night that the specific departments present the information. Okay. And Jenny, I mean, I, I think that's consistent with the 718 language. Okay. Okay. Well then, I'm gonna let my face do the talking on this one um, and say that, um, just a reminder, we have, you know, on the screens here in Chambers, we have a lot of dates coming up. So I'm gonna repeat them. March 26th, which is tomorrow. March 27th, which is Wednesday. March 28th, which is 
Thursday, and the next week, April 2nd, April 4th, and then the following week, April 8th and April 9th, we will be talking about every single one of the departments and every, like I mentioned, every dollar that will be spent in the city of Dubuque's budget. And we will have discussion on those nights. Um, welcome more public input. Welcome more questions from council. Welcome more um, discussion at this table and then also with staff. And then uh, please do provide input as, as public members. Um, the, there's a budget comment form and also you can contact the city council at any time through email or phone in any way you like. Um, and um, Mr. Sarge, since you're the only one sitting here, I'll apologize to you that we were not able to directly answer any of your questions this evening. Look forward to getting the opportunity to answer those later. So with that said then, um, we'll just go ahead and have a nice short night and call it a night. And I ask uh, Adrian to call the roll here, please, and then we'll have a vote. Point of information, please, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I needed further explain to me that we're supposed to approve something uh, without actually asking about it so that we can be clear. And so um, the, the, the motion is to receive, file, and approve. Now, this is not the first time we've gotten the information. Right. But, um, and so, you know, we've considered things, and, and, and I suppose I could vote uh, without asking these clarifying questions. But the process, uh, the legal process, includes approving guidelines without scrutiny? Mm -hmm. Yes. And... Um, the and I would I would comment, Mr. Resnick, that the um, discussion that we were able to have at the public hearing or at the setting of this public hearing was the discussion around where to set the rate at its maximum level, which is where we have it currently. So we we cannot by law raise the rate the the property tax rate any further than it is tonight. We can, however, by law decrease it before uh, on April 11th. We, we can do that. Is that, is that accurate, Krenna? Correct. Yeah. So what we will be voting on right now will be the maximum rate, um, knowing that we have an opportunity to lower it. Um, but we don't have any legal ability, even tonight, to raise it. So, and, and feel, feel free to, if, there's, if there's more clarification. Well, uh, just incredulity, that's all I have to tell So your face is also speaking. <laughs> yes. Fair enough. One of those. Um, so, and that's entirely accurate, and we are to uh, vote without any clarification. So, I, I think the best way I can describe it is that we're all muddling through this new process and uh, continue to hope that there's some additional guidance or clarity uh, provided. Um, because as you know, it's it, it became disjointed a few years ago, and it kind of continues to be um, disjointed in the in the code requirements and the process that has been laid out for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage all of us to make sure we have anything tonight that we need to ask. Um, write it down, and we'll be back tomorrow night to begin the process at least. Okay. Any further clarification before I call for the vote? All right, motion before us here is to receive and file, uh, approve the proposed um, tax rate and dollars for fiscal year 25. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Barber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. That motion passes 7-0. With that, we have no further items on this agenda this evening, so we'll see everyone here tomorrow night, and we are adjourned. <laughs>